Welcome everyone to our prison education series of the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. We speak to prisoners and former prisoners from around the world to find out what impact education and learning had on them during their time in prison and thereafter. I'm very happy to welcome today Wilfredo Laracuente to the series. Wilfredo, can you start by introducing yourself in a few sentences, please? Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Wilfredo Laracuente. I'm 45 years old from the Bronx, New York. I'm a former incarcerated leader who just returned back from St. St. Correctional Facility on July uh, 19th of this year. Uh, currently working with Columbia University at the Center for Justice. And I'm also working as a, a teen advisor for the New Settlement uh, our Community Center on Jerome Avenue in the Bronx. Thank you very much. Can you let us know how long were you imprisoned for and where? Uh, I just completed a 20 year prison stint. And I just, like I said, formally, I returned in July. Uh, I completed my higher education on uh, my bachelor's degree, uh, July of 2019 and my associates, July of 2018. Thank you. When you look at your time in prison and your experience with education and learning there from today's perspective on what would you say, what impact did education and learning have? Well, it's funny you ask that because this is on the, the cusp of the eve of being the 50th anniversary of the uprising in Attica. And during that particular time, they, they laid down the ultimate sacrifice in order to uh, have uh, the conditions be more improved within the Department of Corrections. And they, they made a, a sacrifice that it's humbling to, to speak at times when I'm in these different venues and these different speaking engagements, because um, if it wasn't for their sacrifice, I might not be here today having this conversation with you via Zoom, because a higher education is a form of violence intervention and it saved my life. It allows a different culture to perpetuate with the confines of prison walls, where a lot of men begin to change their thinking and develop a lot of introspection that's essential in uh, becoming the best possible version of themselves and be able to uh, re-enter society as now a solution within their own communities rather than being the, the, the epidemic that plagued their communities for a long time. Thank you, Wilfredo. How did, what did education and learning look like while you were in prison? What kind of program did you participate on? Maybe you can elaborate a bit more on how it was structured, how it was integrated into your daily prison life. Well, Sing Sing Correctional Facility is a very unique prison is unlike anything in the Department of Corrections in New York State. It's the only prison where you can go from a GED to a master's degree in theological seminar. So what that does is that creates a culture that's also backed by the administration and Superintendent Michael Capra, and it trickles down to a lot of the men who are the peer educators within the community. So we have a mantra in Sing Sing, the culture eats strategy for breakfast. So so long as you have a culture that's perpetuated around education, what it does is, and programming and volunteer therapeutic programs, what happens is now is a lot of the men begin to see a lot of hope. A lot of the men are habilitating themselves because if you add the re in front of that word, that means that they had some type of opportunity before. And a lot of us didn't with a lot of the socioeconomic conditions and a lot of disenfranchisement we dealt with and a lot of adverse childhood experiences. So a lot of times we begin to be involved in entrenching these programs and we start to see hope we start to see opportunity. And then what happens is what higher education does, it allows us to configurate ourselves into becoming the best possible version of ourselves, not only for our families, but also for our communities as well. Thank you. Wilfredo, it's very impressive. You obtained your diploma while being in prison. Um, I'm sure, however, there have been many challenges also while experiencing education and learning in prison. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Well, a, a, lot of, a lot of the challenges really stem from, from different areas. Um, there are peers that frown upon you being uh, pursuing your higher education because higher education just isn't for everybody. So a lot of times you have to deal with uh, having to kind of like shuck or get rid of a lot of different social groups and you have to become more mature and enter different social groups of other people that are centered around higher education. Because as the mantra goes, um, you show me who your friends are and it shows you who you are. Um, so that's something that you definitely have to change. And as you start to pursue higher education, not all of the staff, um, the correctional staff wants higher education. They feel some type of way that we're receiving a degree for free. 
and they uh, will put these particular barriers that are in front and potential uh, disciplinary infractions that may impact you uh, continue in your higher education because you must maintain a good disciplinary record while you're pursuing your higher education in prison. So, and also there's there's a lot of little nuances that come with a lot of the, the just the culture centered around prison where there's a lot of hopelessness, there's a lot of despair. And when people start to see um, you were growing, there's a little bit of jealousy that tends to come up into the equation. And you just have to be able to be more mature. You have to be able to deal with the noise of studying. You have to be able to go through the barriers of not having Google and be able to obtain certain references by any means necessary to just make sure that um, you can compete and you can complete your degree and be highly educated throughout the process. Thank you, Wilfredo. Not having Google indeed is, is one of the things that I think many of the students nowadays can hardly imagine. How did you do your research then? Well, what happens is, is a lot of the professors from Columbia University and the Mercy College Hustle Link program understand that we were limited with a lot of things. We had the Encarta and it was kind of old to be on the computers in the learning center. But the most important thing was the, the professors were totally understandable and they would actually bring in references for us. But also what I decided to do because I have a strong family support system was I was able to reach out to them and they can go online for me and they could go ahead and through our correspondence, they can go ahead and send me the necessary, um, uh, any type of research that I needed depending on the subject, whether it be philosophy, whether it be anthropology, whether it be any type of psych courses that I wanted to do anything on or uh, prison reformation or adverse childhood experiences or rejection sensitivity. So what happens is, is that we start to uh, get these particular uh, subjects. And what's different about us than everybody else in the street that are achieving higher education is we're hoarders when it comes to information and we, we attain, uh, retain it very well. So a lot of times when I read certain things, I, I'll read anything I can get my hands on. So it just kind of like sticks and I'm able to apply it to a particular point in my life. And what happens is it retains it the memory and it's just a lot more easier for me when I'm studying. That's great. When looking back, now we spoke about challenges. Um, what would you say are key criteria, key success factors for successful education and learning in prison? Uh, one of the key factors is resiliency. Uh, you have to be able to understand that you are on an island on your own when it comes to your own higher education. What you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. And a lot of times is that's very essential because it becomes a, a learning tool now for everything else in your life as 5, 10, 15, 25 years go by. And as you prepare yourself for the parole board, you have to understand that once you enter that parole room, you are an island on your own and you have to get yourself out of this condition. So I, I kind of equate to uh, kind of higher education like uh, the movie with Tom Hanks, Castaway, is that he had to learn a whole new skill set in order to survive and thrive in that particular setting. And we have to now learn a whole different way of thinking in order to navigate through the academic setting. And we have to learn patience. Uh, we have to retain information. We have to worry on our uh, scheduling, uh, making sure papers are typed and making uh, the particular uh, provisions within our schedule to make sure to go down to the computer lab in the, in the sinks and correctional school building in order to make sure that we have our things on time and to hold our own selves accountable and become our own support system. Because all of us that were in higher education became a support system and we pushed and challenged each other's and most importantly, we made sure to leave nobody behind and make sure everyone was going to graduate. Thank you. Picking up on that last note, uh, did you observe any differences uh, among your fellow students in prison? Um, I noticed a lot of differences where uh, people began to change. A lot of times what happens is when you start to actually apply a lot of this, I have a degree in psychology. So as you're pursuing this degree, all of us have a degree in psychology that leads from Sing Sing Correctional Facility from the Mercy College Hustle Link Program. And what happens is you start to see a lot of the things that you probably never thought about when you were younger. A lot of the things that we deal with in our communities as far as um, cognitive dissonance or as far as just dealing with disenfranchisement or worried about arrested development. We never were able to understand what these concepts were. They were punchlines that were located in certain types of rap songs that we were hear. And, and when I finally learned what these concepts meant, it really meant something to me that I had to give back to my community and I had to just 
make sure that to make my education useful upon my release. And that's something that I do every single day. I mentor a lot of youth now from the ages of 14 to 18. I use my TED talk as well in order to let them know that regardless of my circumstances and I had a lot of lemons, I had to find the sugar to make lemonade. And higher education became that sugar and that fuel that gave me the ability to be released to be able to make lemonade and be an asset in my community. You've successfully completed your degree while being in prison. When looking back, I'm sure some of your fellow inmates also did not achieve that, or you must have had points where you said, if there's just the circumstances or the surroundings, the system would be a bit different. It would make our lives easier and it would enable learning much easier in prison. Do you have any recommendations where you would say, I think we need changes in this or that regard in order to enable prison education to flow more easily? I feel higher education should be in every prison, medium or max. The maximum correctional facilities are ones that need it the most because they breed a higher propensity of violence. Uh, the studies show, and I don't really need data, I can just tell from being around certain prisons, that when prisons have a lot of programming and when prisons have higher education, the propensity for violence goes down because the culture is perpetuated around rehabilitative services or habilitative services that the men can participate in. Not everybody will participate, but it's kind of like the mantra, if you build it, they will come. So a lot of times it needs to be infectious around the men and the men need to see something different instead of seeing hopelessness or despair. Because when you leave men inside the confines of prison with a lot of idle time, the saying goes is that's the devil's playground. And what happens is there's a lot of drug addiction, there's a lot of drug abuse, there's a lot of gang activity, and that, that goes to the ultimate form of commun primitive communication, which is violence. But what I had to learn real quickly, eventually throughout my time, is that if I wanted to get out of here and make my first board and I wanted to become the best possible version of myself, I had to make sure that higher education became a part of my life, and I became entrenched in it, and it was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. Thank you so much. You've already touched a bit, uh, a little bit, you've said about what you're doing today. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on how education and learning uh, also paved the way to your reintegration into society today. Well, the, the best thing I felt was I learned with networking. And what I had the opportunity to do was by being part of the Mercy College Hudson Link program and also um, the culture that the superintendent at Sing Sing, Michael Capra, perpetuated was I was able to meet a lot of people. I mean, I've met Lester Holt. I've met Whoopi Goldberg. I've met Gina Belafonte. I've met Harper Hill. I've had the opportunity to meet Professor Downey, who was the head of the psychology department at Columbia University. And uh, she and I cultivated a relationship while I was doing my TED Talk in 2014. And also when I was curating the new 2020 TEDx event that was at Sing Sing Correctional Facility before the COVID pandemic. So as people begin to see a body of work and they see a work ethic, what happens is they want to see if it will translate out into the street to be a redeemable skill. And she took a chance on me and now um, I am a teacher's aide for her, for her class that she is at Sing Sing. I also work at the Center for Justice as a program assistant. And I also aid her in another program they have which is the Justice Youth Ambassadors Program which is a program of at-risk youth from the ages of 16 to 25 that may or may not have been involved mildly with the criminal justice system. And they sit down with district attorneys and they sit down with judges and they develop policy reform. And what they do is they sit down and develop these policy reform about the social issues that are really challenging them within their own communities, whether it's Brooklyn or whether it's Harlem or whether it's the Bronx or whether it's Queens. And then you're able to see that the judges and the district attorneys and the prosecutors aren't that much different than you. The only difference probably between my 20 years in prison and my education and a district attorney was I had one poor, poor struck of luck and they had a good strand of luck. So my thing is when you start to see that there are black and brown people that are successful, it's allowed for you to change the way a role model is depicted within the minds of the black and brown communities and you're able now to envision life better and, and a better life for yourself as you move on to see your 20s, your 30s, and your 40s. Thank you, Wilfredo. Maybe to close this interview, do you have a final message to those currently imprisoned in regards to education and learning? Uh, absolutely. I feel, you know, good is just a stepping stone to being great. And I feel that you want to have to achieve greatness. 
I've been in those confines of those cells where you try to envision what the first day of freedom looks like. Well, you're never going to be able to envision that type of success if you're not working on yourself each and every day throughout your prison stint. So all those times idly being in the yard or doing a lot of soapbox talk or a lot of gossiping or a lot of backbiting, that's not going to get you anywhere. Yeah, it leaves you with the camaraderie and that particular ethos. But at the end of the day, you have to understand that you have a family and you have people that care about you and need you to start working on yourself and becoming, like I said, always throughout this interview, the best possible version of yourself and to be a productive member of society. So if it doesn't start within the confines of prison, you're miles and light years behind everybody else that's coming out. And with this COVID pandemic, employment is not easy. You're gonna have a hard labor job. You're gonna be working tireless hours and you're just gonna feel like hope is just gonna drain out of you and it's gonna end. So what you need to do is start utilizing your time wisely and working on yourself and finding these redeemable skills that you need to use and let them translate into other skills upon your release because that's something that's very important because freedom is great and it is waiting for you, I am. Thank you so much, Wilfredo, for these excellent final words. Thank you so much for the interview uh, for the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. You're welcome.